Hi all, just give it a minute. I can see people are joining. Thank you for joining this Friday evening. When I stop seeing the numbers go up, that's when I start. Right, I think we are good to go. So hi everyone and welcome to, I think it's our 15th virtual event, um, which we sort of worked out. So 15 in about 10 months. So it, it's definitely been busy. Um, thank you for joining. Uh, same rules apply. I think majority of you would have probably joined our, our virtual event. So you'll know um, we can't see you. So don't worry if you're wondering at the moment, is my camera on? Can they see me? Am I, you know, don't, don't worry, you're fine. Um, but there are ways to get involved. Um, we'll be taking questions like we're always, we always do. So there's a Q&A feature um, that will either answer sort of live on the event or, or we might write back to you. Um, there'll be opportunities to raise your hands. I'll bring you in a little bit like a radio phone in. And obviously if you do want to tweet out, feel free you can use the hashtag AST event if you're watching live, um, cause that just helps us kind of measure and, and, and stuff like that. So I think that's it. I think everyone knows the drill by now. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna welcome my colleague, Tim, um, on to the thing. This, this is a really blue shirt, isn't it, by the way? It's a, my wife got it for my birthday and I felt I have to wear it. And it's, it, I feel I look like Cedric because he has this, he wears this in the commercials. Anyway, Tim, how, how, how are you doing? I thought we'll, we'll quickly cover a little bit about return to fans and, and stuff like that first. And then we'll obviously hit the kind of rest of the agenda. So do you want to give a very brief kind of where are we with that and government and stuff like that? Yes, so people would have seen the roadmap has been announced and it allows for the return of fans up to 10,000 in a stadium of Arsenal's capacity size from May the 17th. This poses a bit of a problem for the Premier League at the moment and it would only allow Arsenal's final home game of the season to be included as a fixture with fans and there's a, now a debate going on amongst Premier League clubs as to whether or not this creates a competitive balance or an unfair situation. If Arsenal have 10,000 fans for the game against Brighton or Fulham have 10,000 for the game against Newcastle and so on, and those are games that decide relegation, qualification for the Europa League. So a lot of work is going on to look at whether another round of fixtures can be moved back two or three days to fit in the timetable, or whether there's the opportunity to get some games covered under a test arrangement get kind of special government approval to have some test events so it's fingers crossed for 10,000 fans against Brighton but not guaranteed I think we just need to see how the Premier League deal with this issue at the final weekend. Yeah, I mean there certainly talks about the integrity piece which is kind of the main topic isn't it how 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 fair is it for a club to potentially have 10,000 if you've got something to play for and, and things like that? I guess that's the, the biggest thing. There has been rumours about maybe seeing if they could change the second last game week and make it midweek so it just gets in. Can you see yeah, that I would, I, would, I would watch this space. What I can update everybody on is in a discussion with Arsenal today, they have said that if they are allowed to have fans in for that game, they will continue to use the existing ballot arrangement and anyone who hadn't had a ticket so far in the ballot, and that's most people, given that they only ended up working sadly for one game, will go into that ballot. They also said anyone who doesn't want to go into that ballot, who is away or wants to wait for next season, will be able to opt out. And just a technical point of information, if you had a ticket in the ballot, I think was it the Southampton game that was, that yeah. was called off at the last minute, then you will go back into the ballot as well. But there will be more, I think it will be or at least eight weeks before Arsenal make a decision on what they're doing. Um, and also very briefly for people, they have said that they will um, do the season ticket renewal process on very similar time frames to usual, which is wait until May, see which competitions have been qualified for, see what the latest situation is with attendance. Yeah, for next season. That yeah, so there's hope and optimism that we will actually see full stadiums in August potentially, which would be absolutely great. Um, but we, we have we have asked Arsenal to keep us updated on renewal plans and and stuff like that, so we can obviously kind of let you know 
um, sort of as and when that comes. Um, you may have sort of seen me look a little bit distracted because um, I think a lot of people who are silver members would have seen in the last sort of hour or so that they've got an email about silver membership. Um, so just, just to be kind of clear on, on kind of how that's worked. So th there was a meeting today um, where Arsenal kind of talked us through their plans, um, which is obviously great for us to know in advance so we can get the information and, and, and kind of help relay the message. Um, but we were, we, we were, we did not realize or know that the information was going out today we thought there was another week which is what we were told so we did plan to get some sort of feedback from members um you know talk about it as a board and then kind of feedback to arsenal officially so as most of you will, will, will have known and seen we did write to arsenal about 10 days ago um we sent a copy of the letter in our newsletter where we believe that uh members that the membership should be rolled over for a year um but we, we we certainly haven't agreed because i've seen a few tweets about supporter clubs agreeing and, and stuff like that i can assure you that that hasn't happened um you know uh, supporter clubs certainly including the ast did challenge um but we're a little bit surprised that this kind of comms has gone out um so we will have more on that probably over the next few days um but if you're a silver member if you're a silver member please do you know if you have views on this then do send us sort of an email or send me or, or the info at email address so we can just kind of collate those together so do you want to add something tim i was just gonna say it looks like a very greedy move by the club to me i see no justification for charging so much for silver membership next year when nothing has been delivered or very little for the membership this year and we will continue to relay that to arsenal yeah and certainly take up the comms issue as well, because it's not quite accurate. Right, okay, shall we kind of move on to the first bit of the agenda? So I'm actually, for once, I'm gonna leave Tim to it for a few minutes and put the kettle on. So Tim, over to you. Thank, thank you very much, Akil. And what we're going to discuss for a few minutes now, and if our guest Matt would like to um, unmute himself and, and, and come on the camera, I very kindly agreed to join us, is to discuss the issue of gambling in football, which I think has, has reached a much higher profile with Arsenal fans because we've seen recently Arsenal step up promotional activity around their partner um, sports bet, um, including tweets going out just before the game, sort of linked to team selection, get your odds here, have a bet on Aubameyang or whatever it may be. And this drew quite a lot of adverse comment from Arsenal fans. And it also overlapped with a, with a timescale where the government is holding a formal review of the relationship between sport and gambling and looking at sponsorship. So we thought we'd do two things. We'd issue a survey to, the, to, to you, the members, so we could understand what you thought. And we also thought we'd get um, an expert and a campaigner on this subject in to talk to us. And I'm really pleased, Matt, who is an Arsenal fan, so we thought of him could come in and talk to us about that. So first of all, Matt, do you, what, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit more? Because, you know, people who follow the gambling scene and, and this issue will know you very well, but maybe most of our members don't. Can you explain your, your, your role in this debate and your position in, on gambling issues? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tim. And thanks for the invitation to speak tonight. Um, really appreciate it. I, I was, I've been involved in gambling reform campaigns for the last nine years, actually. I started campaigning against fixed odds betting terminals and uh, we succeeded in getting the maximum stake reduced to two pounds a spin that came in in uh, April 2019. And following that, we set up Clean Up Gambling and with the Big Step campaign, we've been, uh, we, we formed the Coalition Against Gambling Ads. And what we're trying to do is uh, push the government to, to end all gambling advertising, promotion and sponsorship. So it was the 2005 Gambling Act, which was enacted in 2007, which liberalised gambling advertising. And what happened then in, in, in 2014, uh, for the first time in 2014, the Gambling Commission in Britain uh, licensed online gambling. Until then, it was completely unregulated. And what they said was, if you want to advertise, you have to have a license. And what that facilitated and what they, what they actually allowed uh, are effectively what, what are called white labels. So they're these licensed wholesalers one of them is called TGP, and I'll come back to that shortly, uh, which are based in tax havens. And you can effectively start a gambling brand and piggyback on the back of these 
white labels, which then enables you to be allowed to advertise uh, in the Premier League. And the reason this is so attractive to these white label operators is because they want to get access to the Asian markets, particularly China, where gambling advertising is illegal. So where, where the Premier League is shown, effectively, that is a way of bypassing domestic restrictions on advertising, because the brand is obviously on the screen, uh, it's around the pitch perimeter. So these betting partnerships are very, very important opportunities for these operators who want to access illegal markets. Um, and uh, more recently, uh, countries like Italy uh, have moved to, to a complete ban on, on gambling advertising for the for the reason for reasons of public health mainly. Spain, as from next season, there won't be there won't be uh, any of the La Liga clubs won't be allowed to have any gambling advertising on their shirts. Um, they're only allowed be allowed to advertise gambling between one a.m. and five a.m. Uh, there seems to be a recognition now that the children growing up are much more conscious and aware of gambling, uh, how to put a bet on betting brands, and believing that you have to put a bet on to enjoy the game. And I think that obviously the TV advertising doesn't help. But as Tim touched on, uh, the clubs have really taken these betting partnerships to another level more recently. And some of the things that the Arsenal are doing, one of them, one of them is the tweets that are sort of encouraging the fans to put a bet on you know, first goal scorer or whatever. Uh, I think that this, it, it's, it, it does take it to another level because what you're doing there is really speaking directly to the fans as a club. And you're also using, I think, what is um, a natural brand loyalty that fans have for their club, that the, the gambling company and the brand is, is tapping into that, uh, which I think is, I think, as I say, it takes it to the next level, really. One of the things that would be interesting to know, and I think that the AST could maybe ask about, um, is the a relationship between sports bet and Arsenal, not just the commercial relationship, but when they're putting these tweets out, what we suspect is it's an affiliate relationship. And by that, I mean, um, when, you're, when you have affiliate marketers for gambling companies, uh, so for example, if you own a, a website and you want to have a, a gambling advert on your website, uh, the affiliate marketer will get a percentage of the losses of the person that signs up through your advert, Hit like a lifetime account losses. So are Arsenal getting, is it a profit share arrangement that they have with Sportsbet? If it's a profit share arrangement, then they're profiting, Arsenal profiting directly from the losses of their own fans, which would be, I think, pretty scandalous. And I think most, you know, unpalatable to a lot of people. So it'd be interesting to know the exact commercial relationship between, between these companies. And I suspect given they're so keen to promote these offers on Twitter, it may be that they're incentivized to do that beyond whatever is written down in the commercial commercial arrangement. Uh, as, as Tim mentioned, there's a, a Gambling Act review going on at the moment. Um, it's looking at a lot of things. Uh, at the moment, uh, uh, if you look at online gambling, six, about 60% of the profits are coming from the 5% of the people that are addicted. Uh, so it's really a business model that relies on the, the, the small proportion of customers who, who get addicted and lose more than they can afford. And then there's obviously the, the consequences, the harm consequences that not just don't just affect that individual, but affect the families and, and so on. So uh, I, yes, I'm an Arsenal fan, I'm, I'm an Arsenal exceptionalist. Uh, I always think Arsenal should be sort of, I've always, I've always thought Arsenal to be a very classy club and said it should set an example. And, uh, you know, as Arsene Wenger said in the last game, take care of the values of the club. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that um, if we could get ahead of what may come in the gambling review, which I think will be at a minimum getting rid of shirt sponsors of gambling companies, obviously it doesn't affect Arsenal, but it might extend to betting partners. Um, if we could get ahead of that as a club, I think that'd be obviously fantastic. And Tim can talk a bit more in terms of, I think, the proportion of commercial revenue that this this would account, accounts for it's a pretty a drop in the ocean really compared to I don't think it would pay Ozil's salary for more than a month or something else so, um, when he was around so like I, I, I do think um, yeah that's the direction of travel and if we can get ahead of it as a club I think it will reflect very well. Why is it do you think why is it such a concern about football clubs is it 
is it what, what role do they have that makes you particularly think that advertising sponsorship for a football club is something to be more concerned about that on a high street advertising board or online around a YouTube ad or or direct email from the company why what what is the role of a football club that makes you and the campaigns you're involved with so concerned about this particular aspect of the industry because I think it it legitimizes the the brands particularly the ones that want to advertise to markets abroad um but it also I think uh I think it really binds gambling to to the sport and I think look when we were growing up uh we remember what Arsenal sponsors were we remember when I was growing up it was JVC and Dreamcast and uh, and you remember Man United sponsors Sharp and Newcastle Brown Ale these are iconic and I think we when you're growing up as a kid you remember them and and you associate the brands with with your club and I think it does I don't want to say exploit but it definitely taps into uh, yeah pre-existing brand loyalty that people have and and I think yeah it takes advantage of that certainly so that's the worry is is that kids are growing up now and, and that's borne out in the research a lot of the research that's been done particularly in Australia about how children now are just they know how to put children as young as six know how to put uh, no talk about odds they know what odds are they know how to put a bet on they know the betting brands they can name dozens of betting brands they think you have to put a bet on to enjoy the match so it's like there's a question there about storing up problems for the future surely as people who are interested in the sustainability of football we don't want it to, to be just a betting opportunity it turn into another racing where it doesn't really work unless you have gambling associated with it in, in our survey, Matt, and you'll, you'll probably maybe encouraged to hear this, 63% of VAST members said they didn't think that sporting organisations and football clubs should be allowed to enter into sponsorship agreements, um, and 28% thought that it was okay to do that. But then there were a couple of further questions which were interesting, which talked about were there certain types of arrangement that were okay, and, and people are much more concerned. You mentioned the shirt sponsorship, and also sort of social media that's very soliciting, you know, offering odds. I'm going to follow up your point and ask about the affiliate, but it sort of makes sense that Arsenal are sending tweets like that if they might be earning a percentage of each hit. Are you, are you looking for a complete ban or do you think there's a case for saying, you know, having kiosk in the ground, having, having some sort of low key secondary sponsorship not aimed at the children's market is okay? Because I, I take your point about not being much of Ozil's salary, but as fans, we also want to see Arsenal spend as much as possible on making the team better and investing in the stadium. So how do you see the mix? I think uh, betting opportunities in the ground are fine. I mean, my, my, my biggest, my big concern are like, effectively people, people are signing up to online gambling sites, maybe to bet on the football. That's kind of where they try to, to generate new customers and uh, uh, and that's what drives customer acquisition. It's that relationship between football. But then as soon as you get onto the platform, you're cross-sold the slots. And the, the slots have unlimited stakes. They have, you know, 10% of people that use online slots get addicted. 45% are either problem or at-risk gamblers. So it's quite a high level, rate of harm that's associated with online slots. Um, and that's what they do. They constantly cross-sell market those products. So to answer your first question, I think that it's difficult to justify permitting advertising, gambling, online gambling in its current form, which relies so heavily on online slots, which are like 2.2 billion out of 5 billion total profits last year. So I think that that kind of business model that it currently operates, is difficult to justify promoting that, particularly where there are children. But I think, uh, you know, but there's, there's always been betting opportunities in the ground and that's that's you know venue based and it's not online there's no opportunity for cross-selling gaming products you're just betting on the football so yeah i think there's a balance to be struck definitely but my 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 big concern is is, is the partnerships and, and the fact that the clubs are effectively now promoting gambling which is which i think is taking it to another level I, um, I see so it's 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 almost that the arsenal bet sucks you in and then they've got you in the system and the push all the other forms of betting to you. And just perhaps a final question, because many people won't understand it as well as you. What is what is the scale of the problem out there? I mean, I think 
I think you had issues yourself with gambling and others, but ju just bring it to life a little bit to us, the concerns you have about how much harm this is causing in society. Yeah, well, I think it, it's, um, it depends what estimate you look at on rates of addiction. Uh, so one earlier this year found 2.7% of the population that was one of the biggest surveys that's been done since 2010 and that's that equates to about 1.4 million people it's widely recognized that there's about 2 million people either addicted or at risk and obviously it's a huge proportion of the population it's a significant proportion of the population um but really i think it's important to look at like online gambling really which is what we're talking about here and the advertising of it uh, and, and the levels of harm associated with online gambling, which are which are pretty high. And as I say, 60% of the profits at the moment are coming from the 5% who are addicted. So, yeah, I mean, the scale of it is it is significant. And if you look you look at each form of gambling, online gambling is the, the most harm associated with it. We have had a question in, sorry to jump in there. Um, and it, it says... If, if shirt sponsorship is banned, could that have a massive impact given the number of clubs in certainly in the championship who are sponsored by betting firms? So I think Derby versus Forest is on right now and, and this member has it on in the background and both of them have gambling shirt sponsors. So do we think there are enough brands willing to pay for sponsorship? Because could it lead to actually clubs then really struggling? It's, a quite, it's an I mean, open question. This, they, they, it, it, I think... I think it accounts for about seven percent of um, uh, of wage and transfer fees, uh, the, the, the gambling sponsorship. Um, so, look, clubs spend what they get. Well, they should. We we didn't for a long time, but w clubs should spend what they get on on wages and, and transfer fees. So, if they earn a bit less, they will spend a bit less. Uh, you know, I think that there's. Can, can the club survive? I mean, look, if, they have to, if the government has to look in, in parallel to all of this stuff at ways of funding sport, that mean that, for example, like they do in France, the gambling companies have to pay a license fee to the sports governing body. Tim's very good on this stuff. Sorry, I should probably let you talk about this. But, you know, there's ways of, uh, uh, of making, maybe making up the shortfall. Mm. And a final question, Matt, what, what do you think, what's going to happen over the next few months? And perhaps I, you, the AST will now submit the responses of this survey into, into the government consultation so they can be considered. And I think perhaps we'll share it with right. other supporter trusts because I think it's important that if supporters have strong views on this, they're fed into the government as well. But just tell me how you see the wider debate going and the, and the time scale and what it might mean for everybody. Yeah, so the, the call for evidence on the Gambling Act review uh, finishes uh, the end of March, and then we're expecting the Gambling Commission advice to probably come in September, and then the government to publish a white paper, which is a series of recommendations at the end of the year. And then probably another, I would say, six months to a year before those recommendations are enacted, because then you have another round of consultation. It's a very slow process. So I don't think we're... I think you know there'd be at least another season of gambling sponsorship if it does end up getting banned. But the question I think for Arsenal is when the when the sports bet partnership comes up for renewal, does it want to get ahead of ahead of like where the government's going or likely going? Um, but yeah, I'm optimistic given you know there's definitely support in in number ten. Uh, Boris Johnson especially is like for some reason really against gambling, um, which is helpful to us. So. Yeah, I think there's a, a scope to get quite a bit changed and advertising is probably the biggest fight, but I think we'll definitely get some concessions on that. OK, well, one, Matt, more, Matt. one more okay. very quick, quick question. Which is, it's an interesting one and, and it's, it's not really one for you guys to answer, but, but interested for your opinions. Is there a, a fundamental difference between clubs entering and sponsorship deals with alcohol um, sort of brands as there is gambling brands? And that's from Toby. In your opinions it's all you can um, give <laughs> yeah well i i think it really depends on um the the i think the levels of harm associated with each are are not really comparable i think if you look at the, most people drink and it's a, a very small proportion of people that, that get addicted to alcohol um and of the people that gamble online it's a much higher proportion of people that get addicted to gambling so 
I think that that has to be taken into account. But look, I mean, there is there's an argument that all harmful consumption sectors shouldn't really have a role in, you know, uh, shouldn't be really permitted or access to, 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 to sports teams, to, to advertise on sports teams. So there is an argument for that, but I think we have to kind of prioritise. And I think gambling is uh, it's, it's more like tobacco than it is like alcohol. Okay, well, Matt, thank you ever so much for joining us on that. I think that's really illuminated a few points of understanding and, and why it matters. We'll, we'll make sure we send to you as well the survey results and the, and the submission that we, we put in, and we'll keep a close eye on how this debate goes going forward. So thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thanks very much. Thanks for your time. Cheers. Over to Akil. Great. Now you're stuck with me again now. Um, so I'm going to welcome our second guest of the evening, um, Jane Zolly, um, who will join us very shortly. There he is. I'm so used to saying James Zolly from the Evening Standard. It's James Zolly from ESPN, of course. <laughs> me but too. It's just, it's, yeah, I can imagine. But, you know, James, thanks for obviously um, uh, joining us. Most of our members will have probably sort of heard from you, seen you, met you at our events. Obviously, you have been a speaker before. Um, but generally how are things kind of going it's been a, a very weird year um how was it how has it been for you yeah i mean a, a strange time to change jobs uh, i have to say although it's kind of a similar I've, I've basically just moved titles rather than sort of areas or i've not had to relocate or anything but yeah it's been it's been a i mean it's been a challenging time for every industry right across the board. I think journalism is no different. Um, the biggest thing for us really is that the games are going on um, because that just keeps the wheel turning. I know it's obviously fans can't go and quite a lot of media can't go because the, the media places are restricted, but I'm, I'm sort of one of the lucky ones who's able to get in regularly. Um, it's still a surreal experience now to, to, to go to these games, but, you know, they, they keep the wheels sort of turning for all of us, really. So um, the, the, the most difficult part really was that sort of two or three month period last last uh, summer or early part of summer where obviously the games weren't going on. No one knew if the season would be completed. It was it was obviously a, a very challenging time for everybody. But once the games got going again and then there was a quick turnaround into this season, um, that was that, that was the key for all of us really to have something to write about. And, and now, if anything, it's, it's it's the pace of it is just relentless. It's difficult because you can write you can think you can write a really good narrative about where Arsenal are in their season and then two weeks later it looks completely different so so it's a challenge but we'd rather have the games on than not obviously absolutely and and am I right to say you're still covering Arsenal just as much as you were in your previous role yeah so I, I'm still doing Arsenal Chelsea Tottenham really uh are the three I mean I'm, I'm kind of doing London if if a Palace story pops up or whatever but it, it's 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 those three, and particularly Arsenal still does huge numbers online. You're just obviously now I'm working solely for a website. That's a that's a big factor in sort of where I go and what stories I cover. So, yeah. And just from a sort of personal point of view, I mean that that change from sort of online and a newspaper to just an online was that an easy transition? Was it, you know, did it take a little bit of time? Because I mean, you know, there is something special about sort of writing in a paper as well, isn't there? Yeah, I miss it. I, you know, it was a, it was a. I, I've had a couple of opportunities to leave the standard before, and I, you know, and I didn't feel for whatever reason that, that it was the right time. Um, and I knew whenever I left, I was going to miss the, you know, the, the physical copy, the print version of the paper. I mean, again, obviously at the moment, nobody's sort of really commuting in and out of London. But I, you know, I, when when normality returns, and I and I'm seeing people reading the standard or enter any newspaper on the way to a game, it will there'll be a bit of a tinge of you know, not regret, but sort of missing out on on an experience that I used to really value. That you know, seeing people reading what you would what you'd painstakingly written on the way to the ground. So, I mean, it's it's a different challenge. It's a different audience. I've obviously got an American uh, audience as well as an English one now to sort of think about. So that maybe sometimes slightly changes the way that you might write something. Um, generally, generally speaking, the English audience obviously is more more uh, engaged, more. Um, informed than, than, than the American audience as a, as a rule, particularly about the English game for obvious reasons. But no, I mean, it's, it's still, you know, a story, a good story is still a good story. So that's the, that's the ultimate aim of all of it. And the good analysis piece travels no matter what. So that's, you know, you're still kind of judged by the same standards in that regard. Yeah. That, that bit about you saying it's, it's when you go and you see someone reading the standard and all that, it's, it's really nice. And I, I remember actually a piece I did for you. Um, it was 
it was on the eve of the North London derby. So it was a Saturday morning. It was away to Spurs. Um, so Friday night, it was obviously the paper went out and I think it was me alongside a Tottenham fan and we had to give our predictions and just say some stuff. So obviously I, I, I did that. And then the next morning, very early on, I was kind of meeting friends and stuff around Seven Sisters and getting on that tube, I was alone. And then I just spotted several people having the standard and all Spurs fans reading the piece. So that was the time where I didn't want anyone to recognise me because I thought I was going to get my head kicked in if they realised, oh, that's the same guy, that's the Arsenal fan. So I think you stitched me up pretty well then, to be honest. Um, well, we went, well, we shouldn't have used a photo byline. Clearly, that was the, uh, that, that <laughs> well, was the difference. Yeah, that was. But <laughs> so talking kind of this season and talking Arsenal, I mean, what, what are your sort of views on the pitch? Um, it's It's been... You know, you kind of said it's kind of things keep changing every couple of days. And I think that that has been the name of the game, inconsistency. But what, what are your views on kind of Arsenal sort of this season generally? Well, I think I think history will frame this season as being um, one in which the club was trying to maybe undo some of the mistakes of the past, trying to move forward Um Outs, I think, were always going to be as important as ins in terms of transfers. I think we particularly saw that in January. Um, There's obviously financial constraints on top of that. But but I, I think this, I hate, I know it's easy to sort of use the word transition because it kind of can become a catch-all for so many things. But I think what Mikel Arteta and the club really are trying to do is streamline in whether the pros and the cons of that off the field can be debated. But on it, I think they're trying to um, cut away the fat from the squad and really make it leaner um, and, and get a get a nucleus there that can take the club forward. And I think, you know, it's no secret, I'm sure everybody on this call agrees that the young players have been the, have been the shining light, really, for the season. That, you know, even when the form's... Um, have, Effectively, it's kind of dips. It's, you know, Kai Saka, who again against Benfica was, was just ridiculously good considering he's kind of out on his feet. I think he, you know, in any normal season, in any normal team, he'd probably be given a bit of a breather, but you just can't really take him out of the side at the moment. You know, his emergence, Emil Smith-Rowe, another one, and of course, Kieran Tierney as well, uh, slightly older. You know, those three have been have been the big positives throughout throughout the, the season. And, um you know, you, with, with Thomas Party there as well, you're starting to see Gabriel. There's a spine of the team there. There's a nucleus that I think will become the future, assuming that they can hang on to these players and that they can, um, you know, build around them in the coming windows. You, you can you can start to see what Mikel Arteta is trying to do. And I'm not sure that was ever really the case under Unai Emery. Um, and you know there is still a hangover from the Arsene Wenger era. That's that's just that's undeniable, and and that is inevitable to some extent. So I think you know this this season, while it's felt like wading through treacle at times, and maybe it's one step forward and three back, and two forward and one back and one sideways, it does feel as though, generally speaking, there re- there is a sense of uh, moving to a, a new era, whatever that may look like. We're starting to see it. I think now. Mm. And what's your views generally on the Premier League? I mean, it's, you know, for, for most clubs, they didn't have much of a pre-season. Um, there's a lot of games if you're in Europe, particularly you're sort of playing every three days and, and, and things like that. And I guess it, it, I'm asking you that question, but also because you're actually going to games, the rest of, aren't, aren't, the rest of us aren't. Are you getting a bit of a, a kind of, you know, a lot of managers have talked about injuries and fatigue and stuff like that, but being there, are you kind of sensing that as well? Yeah, I mean, I was surprised. Um, I was at the Man City game and I, and I was surprised about how much of that football was played at walking pace. Mm. Um, it, now, that might be a bit of a freak in that City of 20 games, you know, winning in a row and... They're obviously in great form, and they're you know they're, they're the best team. It looks like they're going to win the league, um, but but there was definitely a measure of conserving energy there, um, and there's not there's not the intensity that that you would see with a full stadium. I think, I mean, I know speaking to several agents during the January window that a lot of clubs were talking about hanging on to their players, you know, maybe players that they might have let go. Uh, fringe players, squad players, 
they were retaining them on the basis that managers were, were fearful of how many they were going to lose in the second half of the season to injury. And I think that's why there wasn't a lot of activity in January that, that you know, managers were thinking, well, we might need a third choice left back or a fourth choice central defender because muscular injuries, particularly those sort of two, three, four week problems are going to accumulate. And, you know, you talk to, to, to managers and players at clubs and most are aware that the vast majority of their squads are carrying some sort of problem now. Mm. Um, and it is a survival of the fittest to some extent. And I, I don't think that it's any surprise necessary that, for example, Man City are, are pulling away at the top because even though it would be reasonable to argue that Liverpool have been the best team, obviously were last season and winning the title, I don't think anybody would argue that City have always had the best squad and they bought very well and they added to that. And, and you know, I don't think any other squad, Liverpool being the prime example, would be able to lose two or three players like De Bruyne and Aguero for extended periods and still be able to churn out the results with the consistency they have. Liverpool clearly losing Van Dijk and the, the various players that have fallen by the wayside. Um, I know they've been concentrated in one position, but still, I just don't think that any other um, squad has got the ability to, particularly the top level, to be able to continue to grind out results like that when losing those players. So, um, you know, credit to Guardiola and City and what they've done there. But but it but it has felt the games are the games are still surreal. You know, the games are you don't I think it's that sense of anticipation and, and that atmosphere, that sort of um pre-game atmosphere almost that you don't it doesn't feel any different Burnley at home to Man United at home. It doesn't feel any different. You know, there's there's still just the sort of sterile atmosphere, the walk on the shouts and the great, it's great, you know, some of it's great that you can hear what's being communicated, particularly the, the way that the press box is spread out. I don't know how well it comes across on the television, but you're kind of, instead of just the press box at the Emirates, it's spread out over probably, I don't know, 12 or 15 rows down yeah. towards the, the pitch. So I, I, one of the games, I think it was the Man United game, I was right down the front, which was incredible really to be that close to a top yeah. level game. And be able to hear what's being said, even down to sort of the specific messages to, to players on the touchline when they're breaking play. That's great, but but it's yeah, it's incomparable to the real thing. That that was my next question, actually. And by the way, I mean, yeah, there's there's a journal on my seat. I can just about see it on TV. Um, every game it makes me quite upset, to be honest. Um, because <laughs> obviously you know where I sit. So, but yeah, talking about that kind of um, you hear the managers and stuff like that, and, and that's something that I think Lee Dixon talks about with us. And there was also a, a piece with Rob Holding where he said actually because it's so quiet, I'm more conscious that I have to be vocal. Um, are you noticing that a little bit? That are, are you know. What is it like? Because, I mean, you know, Mikel Artes is known for quite being quite vocal. What are those messages? How is it all working? Have you noticed any other players maybe come out of their shell a little bit and are talking more or, you know, what just... Yeah, I mean, it, it was, I have to say, initially, the first few games um, in Project Restart last season, you, you were kind of, you felt like you opened Pandora's box and suddenly there was this world of of the good and the bad and the ugly. I mean, some of the stuff you don't want to hear, you know, you certainly don't want your kids hearing, but um, there, it wasn't as bad actually in terms of the language as, as I thought it would be. You mm. kind of thought it would be real sort of trucker stop type, um, <laughs> type of language, but it, it, but it isn't that bad at all. Um, I mean, I think from an, an Arsenal perspective, what you hear is you, you hear very clearly Arteta calling the press and you hear him, you know, speak to let's say they've got the ball and they're starting to press at the top of the pitch, where if, let's say Lacazette's playing through the middle, you hear him, Alex, or if it's Laka, 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 go, you know, over, over, go. And then he talks the rest of the team through the press if, if a team's playing out. Um, and the fact that he does it in so many different languages is, you know, it's, it's just impressive. Um, and the speed of thought to be able to think, right, Ceballos, I need to speak Spanish. Kieran Tierney, I need to speak English. You know, it's very, it's, you know, incredible kind of linguistic skills. Um, but there's certainly an element of, of, I know that speaking to a few um, coaches, that there's an element of trying to hide instruction as well. I mean, a good example maybe was Jose Mourinho was trying to get a message over to Eric Dyer in a Tottenham game I was doing, and he did it in Portuguese because Eric can speak Portuguese, yeah, obviously yeah. spent a lot of time there, but it, it was, and I know having spoken to someone at Spurs, that that was a conscious decision by Mourinho to, to so that fewer people would understand it. And I think there is a bit of that going on. Um, 
you know, because it's, I mean, if we can hear it, obviously the other bench can hear it. Yeah, absolutely. There are a few questions in which I'm going to cover. There's also a hand up. Um, I think Albert's got his hand up. I'll bring you in, Albert, if you, you've just put your hand down, which is kind of what I thought you might have done it by accident. So that that's absolutely fine. Um, in terms of just on that kind of vocal stuff, we have had a question um, from Graham Perry about leadership. So his view is very much that, you know, when Arsenal have been successful, they've always had a centre half who is that kind of leader, you know, this, we've had plenty with Tony Adams, the Martin Gears, the Boldies, um, McClintock's before that. But are you sensing kind of that just general leadership, like a little bit related to the last question, though? Are you seeing any particular players come out of their shell? Are you hearing them more and you're thinking, well, actually, I didn't realise he was as vocal as I thought he was, or he's not as vocal as I thought he was, or, or he's more vocal than I thought he was. Is there any, any what, what is the leadership like at Arsenal? Because it's been something we've been talking about for years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I would say other teams are louder, generally speaking. Mm. Um, they, they are one of the quieter sides. And, and, and I do think that speaks to a lot of what you're talking about with the lack of leadership. And we've all said and, and written things about that in the past. Um, I think it's noticeable that it's some of the, the newer players who are the louder ones. You, you know, everybody talks about Kieran Tierney. I know there's a, there's a clip doing the rounds about him calling out uh, one of the Benfica players for, for diving. You know, he's not back because he's coming forward, which is, which is a great attribute. I mean, that as a compliment to him. Um, you know, Cedric, I think, is quite vocal. Um, Granny Xhaka, obviously one of the older players, but he's, he tends to be quite vocal. I'd like to hear more from the captain, if I'm honest. I don't know if that's maybe a, a slightly antiquated traditional view, but you, you, you don't hear much from Aubameyang when, he, when, he's, when he's leading the team. Um, I certainly think that there could be more in terms of uh, there isn't a kind of Tony Adams style. I keep thinking the name that keeps popping into my mind is Connor Cody. Just when mm. I saw Wolves play at, at Chelsea, I mean, it was the first time I'd seen Wolves for a while. And, and honestly, that guy is relentless. You know, absolutely. If he's not barking at the, his teammates, he's barking at the referee, at the linesman. You know, United have Harry Maguire, who's very similar to that. Um, I mean, City, uh, from, from memory, I don't think City had someone who was quite that vocal all the time. But generally, the, the, the top sides have one or two players like that who are probably trying to referee the game as much as they are uh, talking to their teammates. I, d I don't see that with Arsenal necessarily. And I think that is part of the reason why, um, you know, Mikel maybe is so, is so vocal on the touchline. And, and I remember, as much as I know he's not uh, remembered particularly fondly, I do remember Unai Emery, um, trying to tackle this behind the scenes as well in trying to sort of encourage the players to speak out and be a bit more vocal. Um, and I always remember when, I think it was at Crystal Palace when they conceded a goal and I they, I think they were 2-0 up. We had a two-goal lead and they conceded one and it looked a bit nervous. I think it was they were 2-0 up and it went 2-1. And, and you could, I saw Emery on the touchline straight away and he was kind of almost saying to the players, "Come on, you know, don't retreat into your shells. Come on, you know, stick your chest out, show me something, don't, you know, you could see yeah. him getting really irate on the touchline because there was that that sort of almost um, inherent desire to kind of just all oh, back off a bit, oh, we're a bit nervous here, we're a bit in our shells. And I think, again, that going back to Arsene Wenger hangovers, I think that's a hangover from that era that mm. um, there weren't enough who were ready to take responsibility, particularly in the difficult moments. Mm. I had a couple of questions. I'm going to sort of, Put two together. So uh, Andrew has asked, what is the project in your opinion? And you talked about it earlier, James, that you said mm. you can sort of see what Mikel's trying to do. And then sort of the, the secondary one from Paul is how much support will the Arsenal board give Arteta? Worst case, if we lost to Olympiacos and uh, failed to reach the European places in the league, would the board still on board and exec still keep faith? So it's kind of two questions, a project and then Worst case, would they still keep faith? In terms of his position, yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't see Arteta losing his job this season in almost any circumstances. Okay, if it completely unravelled and the players stopped playing, then you know, and it was a bottom half finish, then I think you know, it, it, it would be a difficult ask. But you know, for me, a lot of this goes back to the restructure. Um, you know, making Arteta manager rather than head coach was a significant decision that I think at the time they sort of tried to bury as almost a semantic 
nod to winning the FA. You know, well done, Mikel, you've won the FA Cup here. Have a sort of small promotion, but really that was. I, I feel that was a quite a symbolic moment because it, it kind of marked at the end of the shift away from one man managerial autonomy makes all the decisions. Everything goes through him. You know, Arsene Wenger, and then the whole Ivan Gazidis period where he appointed nine different department heads, quietly stripped Wenger's autonomy started trying to get more football expertise around the club. So it wasn't sort of solely reliant on, on, on the, the, the genius or flawed genius, genius as it ended to be of one man um, and, and really try to share some of that, 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 that responsibility around. Really, this is a bit of a return to that. If you think about the, 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 the overhaul that's gone on behind the scenes, you know, with Mr. Tat leaving his family, those kind of, those sort of, um, specialists if you like or experts in certain positions it's very much gone back to uh Vinay, Edu, Mikel Arteta, Per Mertesacker you know they are now the sort of four of the most influential voices in terms of the footballing I mean Vinay maybe less so but but those three and then Vinay sitting above them very much sort of the the, the key footballing um voices now in the club and I think the knock-on effect of that is while I understand why they wanted to make Mikel um, you know, give him more, give him more of a central role. He, it does also make him harder to sack, because you're, you know, the whole idea of the post Wenger era was that you were supposed to have. And I remember Ivan saying this to me specifically, that what they wanted to do was have a structure in place so that a head coach was effectively, to an extent, interchangeable. So that what they had was a system and a, and a, and a methodology and a set of values and a style of football, however you want to describe it, that a philosophy, I suppose, is the, is the you know, the, the, the word, the popular words, that survived an individual. Um, and it does feel a little bit like they've gone away from that now and they've put a lot of eggs in the Mikel Arteta basket. And I can understand it because the guy, you know, he speaks very well. He's clearly a good coach. Um, he's improving players. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's to his credit. They bought reasonably well so far. I know people throw William at me and one or two others, but I think you know the the bigger money. You know Thomas Party. I think if they can get him fit, I think will be a very good signing. Um, you know that th- th- you can you can start to sort of see. I think the the the, the design of the team. I think it's significant that he sh- he wanted to get Odegaard in to play with Smith Rowe and not on a rotational basis swapping him in and out. I think what he wants is technical players in those sort of advanced positions behind a central striker, a bit, a bit Man City-ish, if you like, um, sort of ball players. And, you, you know, you can start to sort of see that a little bit. Um, and, and they're going down this road now. And I think they have to dis- accept that there are going to be some difficult moments along the way because you are placing an awful lot of faith in a manager who, let's be honest, has got no experience. There's no, We don't know how good he is. He doesn't know how good he is. There's no, there's no track record to work with beyond having worked under arguably the greatest manager of, of our time. So um, having made that decision, I think they have to persevere with it now. And it was always going to take three or four, five or six windows before Arteta got the kind of squad that he wanted. And, and that's why I think they deserve a lot of credit for the, for the business they did in January, because they got out of the door a lot of the sort of peripheral players who could have been causing problems or or could have um, chipped away at the unity that, that he's trying to build, that nucleus that he wants to take the club forward. Mm. Um, a question from sort of Paul about kind of scouting. And, and I think it, it kind of relates to the sort of what you've just said, that, you know, Ivan Gazidis got together a structure in place and it was the continental structure. And, and I remember at a, a fans forum, Raul Sanelli was, was asked about kind of how the scouting works. And he said that, you know, this was in the Unai Emery era, but he said if if Unai Emery kind of says he wants a winger, he'll give recommendations, but then the structure will go and get that winger, which I guess you could argue because he wanted a winger, he recommended Zaha and they went and got Pepe, but he said that's how the structure works. Emery wants a goalkeeper, they'll go and get him a goalkeeper. He, obviously that has probably changed as a head coach being a manager, but what is our scouting structure at present and what do you think it is? Because we all obviously heard about kind of, you know, uh, the number of scouts, obviously, you know, moving on from Arsenal. We've heard about stat DNA, but, you know, obviously you, you may not know the answer to this, but what, what's your sort of view there about the scouting at Arsenal? Well, 
you're right to say that it's been stripped back and it's been stripped back maybe a bit more than people realize um I think one of the one of the reasons why that's happened is because I think they've looked at um, the way that there's been a shift towards players moving to certain agents and agencies, and actually it's become as important to know the agents and the agencies and the likelihood of availability of players as it is for talent identification. Because you know, with, with video analysis now. Uh, it's kind of you know everybody in the game knows who the top players are. It's it, it, the art has now become acquiring them ahead of t- ahead of somebody else, and that you know the negotiations transfers are tougher than they've probably ever been to pull off. Um, I mean, I know that this isn't Arsenal related, but I know that I won't name the club, but another Premier League club laid off a few scouts, one of whom I know quite well, um, and it, I was just asking him about. When the, this was during when the games had stopped last summer, and I said to him, "You know, now now the games have started again during Project Restart. Are you are you getting back out there? Are you getting to getting to be able to work?" And he just said, "You know, the, I think what the clubs have learned during this period is that they can do a lot of their scouting remotely, um, you know, as in video analysis. Mm. That sort of idea of going to see a player and get a feel for him. Of course, you know, if if you get a long way down the line with a specific target, I'm sure they'll want to see him live. I'm not saying that that won't happen, but the sort of process by which a player is identified and and, and then recruited is is a bit more digital now than it than it has been previously. You've mentioned stat DNA. Obviously, you know, the volume of data on on players is 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 remarkable now that they have to work with. So that sort of that. That idea of of a scout finding a kid who's not already uh, with an agency, you know, that's the key thing. If he's not already with an agency or with an agent, he's probably already touting him around. I mean, January, and I think the summer might be like this as well, um, you know, January was a window in which agents were really trying to push deals because the clubs didn't, as I've already explained, the managers didn't want to let their clubs, uh, let their players go or, um, risk having a smaller squad and the clubs obviously from a financial position didn't really know what COVID was going to be uh, like for them over the next sort of six months 12 months um, and wanted to keep their powder dry in what's naturally quite a quiet window anyway mm-hmm. and I wonder whether that will be the case in the summer whether agents will will be the ones who are trying to generate the traffic generate the business um, I think that's part of the reason why they've just they've made the decision they have with the scouting I think also it's that they they very much trust um, Mikel Arteta's judgment and they think that with Edu they have somebody who has the contact book to keep them sort of in the loop with with the next big thing you know the, with those talents that um, you know that they could the, the sort of Gabriel Martinelli's yeah, yeah. Um, who might be able to pick up for us for a snip and then you know become a become a regular Premier League player not that he's playing much at the moment well we, we've got a question that I'll come back to on Gabriel Martinelli from Kane Baker but just just quickly on that sort of just a finish that kind of element the, the, the you know you talked about the structure being changed and and you know you talked about pair um edu and, and mikhail now being kind of the, the the senior football expertise but i mean mikhail we've talked about but how do you think kind of edu's doing in the role um from the limited that we know because obviously you know it, it is a little bit different as a technical director you're not as visible but from what you've seen and heard How's he kind of doing? And, and I guess is he, you know, is he starting to be respected in, in kind of in England and the, the, you know, in his job, not as a player, obviously. I think he was one of the uh, significant characters in the January negotiations to, to get rid of the players, you know, Erzul, Kalasinac, and Socrates. Um, and I know I've made this point already, but I, I do think I do think that that was a really important window. For, for trying to back, back the manager in a slightly unconventional way, which is to sort of say not, you know, people think of backing a manager and you say, well, let's go and give him a load of money to go and get striker or whatever. This was backing the manager to pay off players who he decided he'd made a judgment. And I know the Mes- we could have another hour on Mesut Ozil and, and, and the rights and wrongs of that entirely. But let's not. But, <laughs> but you know, there was a, there was a judgment call made yeah. there. There was obviously a lot else going on, but there was a judgment call made that Özil not only was not going to be part of the team, but he wasn't even good enough or considered uh, a relevant piece of a twenty-five man squad. And that is a big that's a big financial decision to make. Now, 
my understanding is that he got he got the vast majority of the money that was owed to him. I mean, the vast, vast majority. Mm-hmm. This wasn't a, a case of Ozil coming cap in hand and saying, all right, let's call it a day. The club, the club gave him the vast majority of their money. They weren't lump sum payments. Um, they're effectively still on the books. They're still getting sort of um, payments down the road until the till the summer. Uh, those three players, but you know, they've they've got them out the door, and that was the key thing that they were just wanted them out of the out of Colney. Um and that I think that reflects well on Edu. Um, look, I mean, he did well, I think, in the party deal. I think that will become a good transfer for them. It's probably too early to judge him in in terms of the acquisition side of it because he's not really had that that long in the job, I think. Um, but he. He is he is someone who's uh, communicative. He, he he's approachable, um, and I think some people make a lot of the relationship with Kier Jurabjian. Um I think he has to find a way to make that work to Arsenal's advantage because there's nothing necessarily wrong with having a key agent like that on side. Um, I know. Again, I won't name them, but I know that Kia was pushing one or two players Arsenal's way in January. They chose not to take those options. But I think the fact that they have that relationship that Kia could say one day, well, here's a player you might want. And mm-hmm. suddenly that that relationship, and I know people have been quite critical of it because of the William situation and, and Cedric's kind of slow start, David Luiz, divisive figure. But, you know, let's say, I don't know, this summer... There's a there's a player that Kier's quite close to that he could put Arsenal ahead of the pack in, and suddenly you're saying that relationship that's a genius move that and you know and he's no, they're not the only club who do this by the way I mean you know there's a lot of other clubs who have really tight relationships with agents and we can get into the ethical arguments of all of that, um, but the the challenge really for Edu is if they're going to go down this sort of slightly more agent cosy relationship in terms of talent identification or talent acquisition should we say. They've got to make that work. They've got to make the money go as far as they possibly can, and they've got to make those connections pay off for the benefit of the team. Mm. I, think, I think with the Kia thing, I think when people heard him on on radio stations, kind of seemingly talking on behalf of Arsenal, that's what got got lots well, of questions, and that's when we actually got a lot of contacts. Well, I, I've got to say, I, I think that part of it is a failure of the of the communication at the top level of the club. I think that mm. they, you know, in those moments. They, and this isn't an argument I've been having with them behind the scenes for years, which is, I, I, you know, they're too reactive in their public communications. Um, they should be coming out and explaining more about the process and, you know, the, the, the sort of longer term vision, the aspirations of the owner. Um, they should really be more visible, more publicly visible. And this was a problem, you know, that dates back. To, it goes back to, to, to the Wenger years because Wenger was a lightning rod for all of it. He would just, t- he was so brilliant. We'll say what you like about him. He was always charming, always charismatic, always, you know, I mean, look, we, we've all been in the AGMs where they were stormy affairs. They yeah. were really, really, st- and then he would get up and speak. And you might not have been happy with everything that was said. And I'm not saying he came out and the sun was shining and all was good. But he's, when he spoke for 10 minutes, the, the mood yeah. in the room, it yeah. changed. And he was able to have that effect. And obviously they haven't got that that sort of um, figure. I mean, Mikel, I think, is very good with us, with the media. Mm. Um, you know, he speaks very well, a lot better than Unai. Um, but I still think that they should have, you know, it is, it is Vinay's responsibility or Edu's responsibility ultimately the Cronkies' responsibility to be a bit more publicly visible because yeah. then, you know, Kier isn't, there's no vacuum for Kier yeah. to fill. Yeah, and that's absolutely. that's the thing. That's the, the consequence of that. And of course, the knock-on effect of not doing it is that Kier then does. And then because yeah. there isn't anything to bounce it off, suddenly you think, well, actually, is Kier, is Kier speaking on behalf of the club? Mm. Then they think they've got to react and then they're on the back foot yeah. and Just suddenly it becomes around. a, yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's completely yeah. skewed, which... I just think is a, is a is a wider issue with Arsenal that they they should be a little bit more a, bit, a bit more proactive in communicating and and you know mm. something I always say to them because this goes down to even giving us players to speak to you know if Arsenal lose back and I'm talking pre COVID because we can't speak to yeah. players directly at the moment you know if Arsenal lose they wouldn't give us a player to talk to as a follow up and the way I'd always explain this to them when I worked to the standard was say it was a Sunday game and say right. My boss has said to me, there is a page on Arsenal in Monday's paper. 
do you want to fill it or do you want me to fill it? And you don't want journalists filling it because if I've got nothing to fill it with, I'm going to write about what's wrong with the team. If you give me player or, you know, manager or whoever it is to come out and say X, Y, Z, whatever it is, even if it's platitudes, I'm not arrogant enough for a second to think the fans are going to want to hear more from me than them. So they get priority. Mm. But when you don't fill that space, whether it's a page in a newspaper, five minutes airtime on radio or TV, the journalists are going to fill it and you do not want the journalists filling it. Yeah, can't control the story. Yeah. I can see a hand up from Helen, which I'll come to in a second. I'll just make sure she has sort of no, she's put her hand up. I will come to you in a minute if your hand is still up. But there was a question from John Ramsey. Um, he did ask about the influence of the Cronkies, but I think you've covered that. But he said, how do you think our backroom sort of structure kind of compares to other clubs and other top clubs in England? Because that's, again, you know, I think Mikel's got two assistants. He's got some other coaches, but we're not, you know. How do you think that kind of compares, if, if you've got any sort of knowledge there? Um, I don't I don't see any radical differences, to be perfectly honest. I think it's a fairly it's a fairly conventional setup in that um, you know, there there are there are people with the with the sort of assigned roles that you would expect them to have. Um yeah, I am not sure what to say about that. In in, in that I, I don't I don't I don't see um I suppose what he doesn't necessarily have is is the kind of older heads around him that you thought maybe he might he might want. I mean, he doesn't need that sort of um, I'm trying to think of like a Steve Clark type at Chelsea mm. when they get a foreign manager who comes in who doesn't necessarily know the club. He, you know, obviously he doesn't need that. He knows the club yeah. sort of inside out. So um, no, I, 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 they're they're good. I know one or two of them. They're good. They're good. They're good people. Yeah. I think the coaching setup, you know, it needed it needed overhauling from a few years ago and I, I think to be fair to the club they've, they've made positive strides in that area cool so we said we'll come back to a few of the players so we'll, we'll do sort of a, I'll throw a few names at you and just sort of give me your opinion but there was a, a question from Kane Baker about Martinelli um, you know I think and, and I've seen this on social media as well that it kind of you know, when he came back from injury, we were desperate to see him and he brought energy and we were in the slump then. He played well, we got injured in the cup game and then haven't really seen him. And, and you know, despite probably playing all right yesterday in Willian, people were surprised when Willian came on over someone like Martinelli or even Pepe. But what, what's your view on Martinelli? You know, is does Arteta not fancy him? Does he fancy him? Do you think it's just a bit of he's protecting him? What's the what's the view there? I think it's about um, profile of player. This, I, I, you know, you could feel the energy coming off him when he when he came back into the team. I was I was at those that well, that that game uh, back in the last year. I think it was when he came back and. Um, you know, he stood out a mile in terms of the, the the energy that he brought to the side. I think sort of touched on this already to some extent that I think in those advanced wide positions, I, th- I just think it's really significant that you brought Odegaard in, and not as a di- not as a sort of rotation player for Smith Rowe, thinking okay, this kid's just broken into the first team, we need to kind of protect him a little bit. That very much the word from the coaching staff is that they want to get those two in the same side. I think if you think of Saka as well as a three, and 40, if you're playing 4-2-3-1 and those are your three, Martinelli's a different type of player. You know, um, I, think he's, I think he's a very good player, a very useful mm-hmm. player to have. And I, you know, I certainly think there's a case of saying you should get more football. And maybe if, um, you know, your sort of technical approach to a game is not working and you want to go a bit more direct, then he's, he's an absolute prime candidate for that. Um, but I think that might explain why he's trying to shift a little bit towards this sort of more technical um, ball playing, advanced attacking midfielder or wide player, um, which is not exactly the profile that Martinelli is. Now, of course, you could argue that Martinelli could play through the middle as a nine. And I do wonder in the summer when you you would expect that Lacazette, I think, will probably go. Um, what they'll do there with the striking position, whether they'll look to bring another player in. They've got a decision to make about Eddie Nketiah as well, given given his contractual situation. There'll be some changes there. And I wonder, I don't know, this this one I don't have any inside information on yet, but I don't know whether maybe they view Mark potentially as a, as a number nine who could rotate with Aubameyang. And, that, and that then you don't really need to worry about that left-sided position of Martinelli anymore because you've got him in, in the team higher up the pitch. Yeah. 
Um, Emil Smith Rowe, you mentioned him there. I think in this this summer he'll have about two years left on his contract. Are you hearing anything about sort of starting to discuss terms and things like that? Um, any kind of Ooh, sorry, I mean, which which player? Sorry, you probably Smith Rowe. Smith Rowe. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, so the the the, the story there is that. Um, Essentially, he wants to focus on his football for the time being. There haven't been any uh, contract negotiations yet. That's not for any reason. There's no issue there. Um, I, I spoke to someone in Smith Rowe's uh, camp, and, and, and they they focus really on, I think, getting him, you know, 15, 20 games in this second half of the season to uh, to have a body of work to really sort of cement his place in the team. He's just focused on playing at the moment, and that's a little bit of a cliche, but I think he wants to just establish himself. Uh, and then uh, the club's intention is is to renew. I think his intention is probably to renew as well. Um, but they want to look at it in the summer and 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 not now. Um, I know mm. that there was a story around at the time that, that the club were thinking about opening talks. Um, that hasn't happened yet. I, I don't believe there was there was much in that at that point. At least going mm. on what his represent, representatives told me. So to I fair, wouldn't be fair. worried. I wouldn't I wouldn't be worried about it. I just think that you know he's only played a handful of games and look. I think if you're if you're Smith Rowe and his reps, you're probably thinking, well, if he does, you know, play 15, 20 games and he keeps going in the in the style that he is, they're going to be able to, you know, have a, have a stronger negotiating position when they do sit down. So, mm. um, and I think also the club are probably looking at some of the renewals like that and thinking, well, we need to kind of know, maybe not with Smith Rowe. I suppose you'd think he'd be at a financial level that they could afford to do it no matter what, but they probably are thinking with one or two players. We need to know what football we've got next season, what European competition, what income we're going to have in terms of match day revenue. I know we're all looking at June the twenty first as the you know as our Independence Day and all of that, but <laughs> we don't know if you know if fans are going to get back in next season. Yeah, you know, full capacity, well, social distancing. Yeah. We don't. We, there's so many unknowns that I think with 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 the contract stuff, they just want to leave it, kick it down the road a little bit, and then look at it yeah. when there's a little bit more clarity. Mm. Fair enough. There's a few questions I'm going to go through. There's about 10 from someone called Larry Shaw. I'll pick one of yours, Larry. Um, but before I do that, um, Hector Bellerin, there's a question on Hector Bellerin. Um, there, was, there was kind of rumours about PSG last summer. Hector's had, you know, he's had injuries. He's maybe lost a yard of pace. There's, there certainly has been, people have been looking at his performances. Do you think he could be potentially one where Arsenal think actually he's been here a while now and there's a bit of value on him? He could move on. Well, I'm I'm very upset that you've not read the ESPN notebook on the website today because I actually have a story about this. So I I've been prepping for this, you see. <laughs> or or, or I sh I've missed the cue. I should have known. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, no. I, so my my understanding of that situation is that he wanted to leave last uh, the end of last season. Uh, Mikel Arteta talked him out of it and says, uh, essentially, they came to an agreement that if you give me one more year, um, we'll be more sort of inclined to let you go at the end of the season. Um, Bellerin agreed to that. And I think that they are both looking at this summer as, as the right time after 10, 10 years at the club um, for him to part ways. He'll have two years left on his deal, so they would expect to command a reasonable fee for him. Um that, that I think is where they are with it. Um, I think it also partly explains why um, Mikel was so loyal to Hector in the early part of the season when he'd kind of changed pretty much every other part of the back four mm. or back five, depending on what team they were playing. Um, but Bellerin kept playing. And I, I do think there was a residual hangover from that agreement that they said, look, you know, you can't really say to a guy, I want you to stay, please give me one more year. And then park him on the bench. I think yeah. that was a, I think that was a real part of it. Obviously, you've got to remember with those two, they go back a long way. The good friends from playing days. Mm. Sometimes it's overlooked that Hector's actually the PFA rep for the Arsenal squad. I was I was going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. So he's a he was a key. He he was kind of the conduit between the the, the board and the first team during the wage deferral uh, wage cut conversations. Yeah. Um, so you know he's been an integral part of it, and they are you know they are very close. And I think I think had it not been Mikel Arteta, I think Bellerin might have gone last summer, but I, I do mm. feel that I don't. I'm not saying he's agitating for a move at the moment, but my understanding is there was an agreement said you give us one more year, and then we'll consider selling you. And mm. I think they probably will sell him in the summer because I do feel it's it's probably reached the right point for everybody yeah, involved. Yeah. Well, we haven't got long left, James. We're going to throw a few names at you from a few questions, but 
I guess two questions. One is the players that are on loan at the moment. So mostly thinking Saliba and Gwendouzi, I guess. Do you think any of them will be coming back? Certainly Saliba, I think Gwendouzi might have, that shit might have sailed. And then also the ones that have come in to Ceballos and Odegaard, can you see potentially any of them extending their stay, um, you know, post this season? Um, right, well, Gwendouzi, I think is, uh, it's a long way back for him. I think it's a long, long way back. Um, I wouldn't say never, but I don't, I don't see him particularly while, while Mikel's still there, um, uh, starting his career or restarting his career again at Arsenal. Sorry, I'm losing my voice a bit. Sorry. Um, Saliba's, yeah, Saliba's an interesting one. Um, the coaching staff really don't rate him. Uh, the coaching staff that didn't sign him mm. don't rate him. And I'm, that's not to say that they never will, um, but the view was which is why he went out on loan. The view was that he was a long way from being good enough to play regularly in the Premier League. Um, I know that he's he's done okay so far on his loan spell. I think he was, did he win a player a month award out there? I think there? he did. He might have, I yeah. Think he, I think he did. So, you know, he's, he's he, you know, he's starting to improve there and he, and, you know, he's young, he's got, He's got a lot of raw ability. I'm, I'm not saying never say never again with him, but I do feel that from the noises that I was hearing, I wonder whether it might be another year that he might need on loan. And, and, and you do wonder about the damage of the relationship between that coaching staff and the mm. player when you think about some of the things that he said when he's been out on loan. You know, he's pretty much sort of said, you know, I came in and I've not been given a chance. Mm. I, you know, I signed for one manager, I'm not played for another. Um, for Instagram it's yeah, situations yeah. as well. Yeah, so you, you do think there are probably some some um, bridges to build there. Um, but he's young, he's on a long contract. The, the club have invested quite a lot of money in him. You'd expect there at some point to, to be, let's give this a go. I, would, I don't think they'd write it off straight away. Um, but I do think there's, there's a distance left to travel on that one. Mm. Um, the Odegaard and, and Ceballos ones, yeah. There's a bit. I mean, there's a there's a big picture at Real Madrid, which is that they haven't got a lot of money, and but they want to buy Mbappe, and they want to do some big. You know, they're looking at Haaland. They want to they want to do some big transfers this summer. How they're going to pay for them is is a, is another matter entirely. And I, and I and I wonder whether they'll look at you know, let's say they try and fund an Mbappe deal. They will look at someone like Ceballos, I think, particularly, and think, well, if we can get reasonable money for him, maybe we'd sell him. Odegaard, I think, less so. I think they still, I think they might have even said publicly that, um, you know, they still see him as, as being a, a component part of their team in the future. So I think he'd be a harder one to try and prize away. However, if they have got to come up with the cash to fund a big deal like that, they're obviously going to be more inclined to sell. I, I, I think of the two, I think that, um, Mikel would prefer to have Odegaard if he can, um, but you know there's no there's there's no secret that the club tried to sign two central midfielders. They got one in Partey. Um, if they can't get another one in the summer, and Sabios becomes an option at the right price, I don't think it's something they'd rule out. After last night, I'm not sure what the opinion is on <laughs> Danny Sabios off that header. Tim, I presume you've popped up because you want to ask the question. Otherwise, it's a bit weird. Well, it was a mixture of asking a question and making a point, and perhaps if Nigel is ready to come in as well, because in talking about the summer there, and James was sort of talking about money we could give to Real Madrid, I mean, I think Arsenal are going to be very financially constrained, but we are going to um, know more about that. We understand that it's likely that Arsenal's financial report that they have to produce will come out next week. But Nigel, perhaps if you just come on for a moment, that's... That's a long time ago now. What, what, uh, when does that report cover and what are you expecting it to show that we might learn about what COVID is doing to Arsenal's financial position? So that, that period is the, uh, the end, ending 31st of May 2020. So for, for Arsenal, that included four home COVID games. So what, whilst the, the restart happened in in june we we missed four games so we've we've written about this on on several occasions what we think it's going to be showing um will be the the loss of income for arsenal at the end of that season 
was somewhere around about 65 million pounds. And that, that includes the lost gate receipts. And there was a rebate agreed on the, on the television deal. Although that's not a cash cost to Arsenal because that rebate will actually come at the end of the three year TV contract with the domestic broadcasters. But if you take the 65 million lost revenue to, to the bottom line, we were saying that Arsenal would show a small operating profit for the season 1920, but we revised that post COVID to an operating loss of about 60 million pounds. Um, all other costs, very stubborn, a small reduction in the wage bill, um, but those revenues flow all the way through to the bottom. We have made predictions of, of course, for the for the current season. Uh, the financial year will end for Arsenal 31st of May 2021. You know, virtually the whole season behind COVID, you know, two games only with 2,000 fans, so effectively no match day revenues. And that's going to be really, really ugly. That could be 160 million loss. So the things James has been talking about, about getting a tight squad, the actions which were done in January. We've talked about the Bank of England COVID loan. Um, it may be a good time to put the figures out just to remind people as to, to the situation that clubs are in at the moment. Um, so, yeah, it's I, they're trying to, trying to not bury it, but it's, it's got to come out at a time to, to also allow people to realise that this, this, is, this is hurting clubs hard. James, do you, do you have any observations on what you're hearing from the wider game? Of course, every club's suffering and we hear things of the, the French league is having huge problems with its TV contract. So it might be that you can still buy because you're buying at a third of the value, um, maybe more swaps and transfers. It, it, it's not going to be like the last few years, is it? No, it won't be. And, and, and I do think this, you know, Nigel's obviously absolutely right. It's, it's going to inform decisions more than ever at clubs and, and and actually I think if you look at if you look at Arsenal's squad in terms of um saleable assets you know players players that you'd you'd be happy to lose I'm not talking about someone like Saka you know or Aubameyang but you know somebody you you kind of say okay if we can get a decent wage for a decent amount for him we can sell him and, re and try and reinvest some of that money I think that feeds the, informs the Bellerin conversation. I think it probably informs the Lacazette conversation and it probably informs the Saliba conversation to some extent in a different way in that they sort of think, well, actually, we just cannot afford to write off a £27 million player. You know, we maybe we do have to give this kid a go and we have to try and work with what we've got, whether that extends to someone like Guendouzi, where the relationship broke down a little bit more, you know, it remains to be seen. But yeah, it, on, on, a, on a wider footballing level, yeah, look, I mean, it... it, it it's easy because the show's gone on. I think it's easy to think, and because football tends to just find money. You know, we always think, oh, this will be, this will be for the last few years. This will be the the TV deal that sort of is the one that's a step too far, or this will be the summer when agents' fees finally get you know under check, or this will be the the, the the season when the wage bubble bursts. Football always tends to find a way or another revenue stream to, to exploit and, and, and open up to, to, to offset and, and kick that down the road. I don't think it can with this. I think everybody, you know, clubs clubs don't take out £120 million bank loans, you know, willy-nilly. I, I know that the facility was there, a very good interest rate. My understanding of that, by the way, is that Arsenal tried to extend that in terms of when they had to repay it. I think they've got to repay it by the end of May. I think they were looking at trying to extend that I don't know if they've been. I don't think they've been successful. Well, they, they will. I think they will have be watching the budget more closely than most mm -hmm. people because that will be when the chancellor will announce whether or not he's extending the terms of loans like that and allowing people longer. I am pretty sure that Arsenal would like the opportunity not to have to repay that all this June and for it to run a bit longer because cash yeah. flow has become incredibly tight. Yeah. You know, and they're not they're not the only, you know, obviously Tottenham took out the same a bigger loan, 175 million from the same facility. So, you know, a lot a lot of clubs, I know West Ham have done a finance deal where they've they've borrowed a lot of money, about hundred million as well. You know, the that I think was a private equity job. You know, a lot a lot of these clubs are going to be looking at, at, at those kind of facilities, whether it's a private equity venture capitalist type scenario where you're borrowing at three, four, five percent. 
it's still better than you'd get in the open market, but it's, you know, it's, it's just going to be a bigger problem for the clubs further down the line. I think it will inevitably have a knock on effect on transfer fees and wages at the top end. This is why you're probably seeing a club like Chelsea, who um, it would be too crass of me to describe them as seeing COVID as an opportunity, but I think they've sensed that they can rebuild using the, the obviously the, the, the wealth that they have. One or two other clubs, Manchester United, I suppose, are a little bit more insulated from it, just given the size of their of their income. Um, but the club, I think, the, the the game rather, is I think looking a little bit more internally for the first time. I, I know that DCMS have been driving some of these conversations about about trying to make sure clubs look after each other lower down the pyramid. Um, there is a recognition this is going to be a tough period for for all of us, whatever walk of life you're in, and, and, and football is no different, unfortunately. Yeah, well, um, watch out for Arsenal's finances this week and no doubt at some point we will send all members a more a more detailed summary of that. But watch out for Nigel's prediction of a 60 to £70 million pound loss for the beginning of the COVID period. Anyway, back, back to you, Apple, to, to finish off. Yeah, so I think I think we're pretty much out of time. Um, we have actually ran over. I think I set this till quarter past nine. I, I never know what time these are meant to finish, to be honest. Um but yeah, no, I think think that's it. I mean, I'm going to ask you for a prediction, James, just finally for this season. How far do you think we'll get in the Europa League and where do you think we'll finish in the league? And don't worry, we'll probably won't remember what you've said in May, so if you're wrong, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not the best with predictions. Um, I, I kind of feel, I mean, a lot of the good teams, a lot of, well, some of the good teams have gone out of the Europa League, which is, you know, and if you look at, if you look at the way the draws panned out, Olympiacos, I know last season, you know, is, is a reminder not to take anything mm. for granted, but you, you, you would see that as a winnable tie, um, a favourable draw, and you're in the semi finals, and from there anything can happen. But as I, I still feel it's it's very much odds against Arsenal winning the Europa League. Um, it's difficult to be upbeat about it, if I'm totally honest. I, I kind of feel like the Europa Conference is starting to look, you know, a, a sixth, a seventh place finish. If that, if that ends up being uh, what gets it done with the various permutations, um, look, they need European football. We're talking about the finances. It almost, I know that Europa Conference doesn't particularly appeal to anyone. I don't think, but any, any, believe me, and, and obviously you guys already know it. Any kind of financial income from European football is a positive. So I mean, the conference it does give you. You know, it, it gives, it gives you, a you bit, something. To be it gives yeah, you something, yeah. and it, and it, and it at least, it, you know, look. I mean, it at least gives you the chance to tell new signings or, or prospective players that you are you are in Europe in some form or another. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I think I think top top six is starting to look difficult. Top eight, realistic, and if you can get six or seventh, uh, you know, squeak a Europa League place depending mm. on how it works. Maybe a Europa League semi final. I think I think that's probably where the team are at the moment. Mm, but yeah, in a cup competition, it's all about the draw, isn't it? Mm. But anyway, James, I'd like to thank you for um, spending the last sort of hour and a half with us this evening. Um, we've had lots of nice comments actually, just saying sort of thank you and stuff like that. So on behalf of everyone and all our members, thank you. Stay safe, and um, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get you back here um whether it's face to face or whether it's kind of on zoom will certainly be continuing so thank you very much oh, thank you pleasure so i should just take your camera off and mute yourself for a second. uh and thank you for everyone for attending um stay safe we'll be back with one of these probably next month i think um and then we're also going to have the ast agm as well at some point so that will be done virtually too so um, have a great weekend. Hopefully we'll get three points. Sounds tough, doesn't it? On Sunday at Leicester. Um, but hopefully, you know, we can still live off kind of last night for, for a few more days. So take care, stay safe. See you next time. Up the Arsenal. Cheers.